Hi, everyone. I guess we'll get started. Uh, just so you know, we're recording the session, hence the need for the mic. I think you can all hear me, but that's why I'm, I'm holding this very large microphone, is for recording purposes. Uh, my name is Kim Frail, and I'm a librarian at the Coots Education Library here in this building. And I'd like to welcome you all to our final event of Open Education Week, which is our panel on opening up course textbooks. So our panelists will be approaching this topic from different perspectives, so it should be very interesting to hear about that. Um, I'll introduce them. They'll each have around 15 minutes-ish, 10, 15 minutes, um, to speak to the topic. And then afterwards, we can take questions or perhaps start an informal discussion about what you've heard. Uh, we suggest using the hashtag on the whiteboard if you want to tweet about this event, so just the UA Open Ed on the board there. So I'll introduce our panelists before we get started. Uh, Fahim Rahman is finishing up his BSc in Chemistry and at the time of the writing of this bio was serving as the Students' Union VP Academic, but as of Friday, was it? Yep. Is our newly elected SU President. So, <laughs> so congratulations. So Fahim hopes to improve the quality and affordability of education on our campus and he runs the Be Book Smart campaign for students and instructors over the summer. He also has a keen interest in supporting other students in their endeavors. Angie Mandeville is the Public Service Manager for the Cameron Science and Technology Library and Winspear Business Library at the University of Alberta and a subject librarian for the Department of Human Ecology, or AILS. She currently co-chairs the Library Student Advisory Committee. And what a fine committee that with, is. With Kim, I'm the co-chair. A fine committee. Um, her professional interests include academic libraries' role in student wellness, and more recently, the lifelong information-seeking behaviors of alumni. And our final panelist, um, standing in today for Janet Wells, we're very lucky though, we'll, um, I'll tell you about her background in this area. Sherry Fricker is the lead instructor for EDU 210, an introduction to educational technology. Um, and that course has an enrollment of over 700 students per academic year. And under the direction of Dr. Janet Welch, this course, which includes a lecture and a lab, has operated without a textbook for several years. The team Sherry works with has recently been involved with the administration and promotion of the current Campus Alberta OER initiatives. So we'll start with Fahim. Thank you, Kim, for the introduction. So as Kim noted, my name is Sahim Rahman. I work for the Students' Union. And uh, the Students' Union is there as a representative for students. And we also do a lot of other work. Uh, one, I'll really quickly cover the four pillars for the SU. They're uh, running businesses like Aliexpress, which you might see in the food court, uh, as well as providing services such as the Peer Sports Center. And we also run programs like orientation. And lastly, we do advocacy or a representation for students. And in particular, uh, one issue that I think the Students' Union has been advocating on for the past decade, if not longer, is the cost of textbooks. Just because as it stands right now, uh, undergraduates in their first and second year are expected to spend about $1,000 um, on their academic materials, whether it's textbooks or access codes or eBooks. Um, it's quite, amount, uh, quite a large amount of money that undergraduate students are expected to pay. And one way that the Students' Union has been trying to tackle that is by running a Be Book Smart campaign. That's something that's been going on for the past four years. And it entails marketing that goes out to students as well as instructors. With, uh, I'll start off with the student side. With, tar with uh, marketing to students, what we do is we put up posters and we do a lot of marketing, particularly around the last week of August and the first two weeks of September. So that's when students primarily p purchase their textbooks. And uh, we just encourage to students to look at other ways of purchasing their academic materials. I know the bookstore has been very, they've been a great partner in um, making this happen. If you ever go to the bookstore and it's not too busy, um, if you're not comfortable with the price that you're paying for your textbooks, they're more than happy to um, search on Amazon, whether it be teacher. And that's one example of what Be Book Smart does. It encourages students to look to Amazon or to use books to get their uh, academic materials for uh, less than full price because secondary is uh, expensive enough already and any little bit to uh, save students' impact on their wallet helps. A few other things that we do is encourage uh, students to look at ebooks. Ebooks can be great too because they uh, tend to be cheaper than your traditional hard copy textbooks, though there are some concerns with that around um, whether you're allowed to use them after the course, expi course ends or what time they expire. And a lot of students like to hold on to, they actually like to hold on to something in their hands as opposed to um, reading off an iPad or a screen. 
So uh, that's the marketing that, or targeted marketing that we do go out to students. Uh, on the instructor side though, what we do is we also encourage them to consider different options. Um, and they're very similar to what we do with students. We encourage them to look at ebooks. Um, although we, the biggest thing is we advocate for a diversity of options. So if you can make ebooks as well as use books, as well as uh, the most recent version of the textbook compatible with the courses that you teach, it gives, it gives students a variety of options to choose from. And students do come from different uh, backgrounds in terms of what their uh, learning preferences is, as well as their financial background. And so it really helps them to succeed if they have more opportunities. Now, one thing that um, B Booksmart has looked at recently is open educational resources. These almost seem like a silver bullet. They almost seem too good to be true because they have minimal cost to students. They can be very high quality and they can also be very flexible. So with an open educational resource, uh, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that's just a resource that's, open under, that's under an open license. The most common example of an open license is Wikipedia. With Wikipedia, anybody can edit it, anybody can verify whether the um, material is accurate or not, and um, it's free. Like, nothing on Wikipedia is done for profit. Um, that's why they work really hard to make sure that ads aren't running. Um, and so open educational resources, I really hope, are the future for um, uh, academic materials, just because for students, they convey affordability. They don't have to worry about textbook costs uh, as much as they do when uh, we're working with publishers for example. Um, they also, like the worst that a student would have to pay would be uh, the amount to print out that material, which would be under a course back. Again, very affordable and it's compliant with a uh, course right. And also it can offer, uh, open educational resources can be very high quality because uh, they tend to be reviewed by other academic staff or uh, faculty members and they can be reviewed by anyone across the world and you can um, see sort of the quality standard that they're up to. And lastly, they're very flexible. So. Um, if as an instructor you decide that you want to go faster with your course or you want to go slower with your course, um, your students can decide, your students will be, know uh, what chapters to neglect or what chapters to uh, spend more time on. And so um, those are the three main benefits with open educational resources that I see for students. They're affordable, high quality, and flexible. Now for prof professors, they uh, convey the exact same benefits as well, actually. They're affordable, so you don't have to uh, charge students as much for their textbook um, or their academic materials. They can be really high quality, even uh, higher quality than a, a published textbook that might be outdated in a couple of years. And they also offer flexibility in that you can tailor your uh, course from year to year and you can update them. And I'm a chemistry student. And so uh, when I took introductory chemistry, I learned about activation energies. And it's honestly been a, kind of an analogy for my life. <laughs> Because if you, like for myself, I'm an undergraduate student still, if I wanna um, do well in my courses, I need to put in uh, effort to get a high quality result. And the, I think it's the exact same thing with open educational resources. There is a bit amount, there is a fair amount of energy that's required to find high quality open educational resources. You'll need to do a bit of research looking at other databases, whether they're at uh, Rice University or uh, the repository repositories that uh, UBC has, or British Columbia has already created. Um, those are examples of the work that's needed to put in, but when you do put in that work, you come out with a really high quality product that um, gives you affordability for students, uh, quality on their education, and well as, as well as uh, flexibility with the courses that you're teaching. And that's really all that I have to say for open, edu for open educational resources, and I'll pass it off to Angie now, who's gonna talk about something else. <laughs> So hello, uh, thanks again. My name is Angie Mandeville and I'm a librarian here at the U of A and I work at both the Cameron Science and Technology and the Winspear Business Libraries. So um, I'm really pleased uh, to have the opportunity to, to speak to you and tell you a little bit about our course textbook initiative um, at the U of A libraries. Of course, we, we've been hearing a lot from speakers this week about, and, and Fahim um, started off talking about textbook costs. We're very well aware um, about, the, um, about that issue and how it's an ongoing source of frustration for students. Um, the, the stats that our keynote speaker yesterday laid out uh, in terms of you know, student debt coupled with the, the what was it, a thousand percent increase in textbook costs since 1977. Um, 
I, I would, I, th those facts are beyond troubling, and I argue that they compel us all. Um, students, librarians, faculty, staff, everyone here at the U of A to take action on this. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, how, what we're doing at the U of A libraries. Um, now, I, I appreciate that open ed resources are being used in a few courses here at U of A, um, and that's fantastic. Uh, the, the truth is the majority of courses still are using commercial textbooks. Um, and so um, some may consider our textbook program a stop gap measure to a degree on the way to hopefully maybe someday full open education resources adoption across the whole campus. Um, but uh, regardless, we feel at the U of A libraries having textbooks available for short term loan. We have students can borrow them for two hours at a time. We're part of the solution to increase student access to textbooks and hopefully mitigate some of the financial burden that's associated with those costs. How did we get started with this project? Let's harken back to 2013. <laughs> Gerald Beasley, our chief librarian, started that summer and brought to U of A libraries, um, I'll say, a renewed commitment to student engagement initiatives. Um, one, of course, is this course textbook project. Um, and the other is the establishment of our student um, library advisory committee. So I'll talk a little bit about both of those uh, initiatives as we go through this. But I think uh, U of A libraries, to, to kick off um, its commitment to the course textbook project, put money behind it and said, we're going to put $100,000 of our collection budget to purchase textbooks to have in our reserve collections for students to, to, to be able to borrow. So. Um, so, okay, so you've got $100,000 on the table, then how do we determine which textbooks to include? Because I'll tell you, having, that's not enough to purchase all the textbooks for every course um, uh, here at the U of A. So what did we do? Well, we, um, uh, we turned to the U of A bookstore um, who provided us with some uh, textbook adoptions reports for um, the academic year of 2013-2014. So we just you know, look through, crunch some numbers, um, which courses ordered, which textbooks, how much of those textbooks cost, how many students were registered in those courses. We also spoke with librarians at Concordia University in Montreal where they had rolled out uh, a similar program um, just a couple years uh, before us. All of that, we, um, with all of that research, we, we thought about some scenarios and, um, and we discussed textbooks at the very first meeting of the Students' Library Advisory Committee, remember? Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was a while back. And, um, and so we established some guidelines and discussing with students thinking, so what, what do you think? How should we best proceed? And so based on conversation with them, our commitment initially was to purchase textbooks that cost more than $100 for classes that had a minimum of 50 enrolled students. So that's how we started. Um, but the initiative expanded um, and as we purchased um, uh, textbooks um, and we eventually were able to lower that threshold and then we ended up buying textbooks that cost $50 or more for courses where there were 20 students or uh, more registered. And we placed those in, our, in reserve collections in all of our unit libraries. Uh, I also have to mention that in addition to the funding from UVA libraries, that $100,000, uh, the Students' Union uh, also supported uh, the, the, pro the project with, um, with some funding. And that helped us purchase additional copies for some of those larger courses, um, et cetera. So uh, it turns out that a natural partner for us and a, a close ally through this project has been our campus bookstore. I've worked really closely with Wayne Anderson, who's the associate director of the campus bookstore, and they share with us regular reports on the textbook adoptions leading up to the term, and we use those reports to determine which textbooks we're going to purchase from the bookstore to have in our collection. And also, uh, we were able to extend 
our budget of 100,000 a week to extend it a bit more because we also did, as part of our process, look to see, well, do we already own that textbook in our collection? So we pulled existing stuff into the reserve program for students to borrow as well. So, um, so that's how we got started. I, I should mention that this was a really significant, I mean, change in our existing course reserve model, I mean, which was instructor initiated. It was the instructor who came to us and said, please place these materials for my students on reserve. And now it was the library saying, we will do this for students um, and to support students, regardless of whether or not the instructor has requested it. It was also important to us as part of our budgeting process to set aside some funds to make sure that um, we could purchase um, textbooks uh, on request of students. So we did have a mechanism on our website for students um, to request um, textbooks if for whatever reason um, it wasn't uh, listed on reserve. So uh, it was launched in, okay, there's some numbers up there. It was launched in January 2015. We promoted this um, for the winter term of 2015 via our news blog on the library website and via social media. We asked our subject librarians to send out the message to their various um, uh, departments. And actually, the Student Library Advisory Committee members were great. Uh, sharing this news with their various networks as well and getting the word out there to students. So um, we're almost, by the end of this term, it'll be a full year uh, that this program uh, has uh, been running. Has it been successful? We're still evaluating that, but so far, so good. I mean, you can see some of the numbers up on the screen um, that as of the end of February, we have uh, have uh, just over 1,600 individual titles, but many more copies than that because we do have multiple copies of textbooks um, on our shelves for students to borrow for over 900 courses. And they've been, they've been using them, so they've been checked out like over 11,000 times as a program, as, as an entity. So it is uh, gaining traction every, every term. So um, some of the challenges um, that we've experienced with this program, um, well, just uh, some of the, right now there's some anecdotes. We, we, all of us that work at the public service points hear from students. What do we hear? Well, there's not enough copies, right? The, the, the loan period of two hours is not long enough, or it's too short, or it's just right. So we, we do hear a, 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 a different things from different students. Um, one of the things that was particularly um, striking was when students find out at midterm or at the end of term that, oh, it's an open book exam, and I didn't know that, and I didn't purchase the textbook, and all of a sudden you have dozens upon dozens of students competing for X number of copies in the libraries. We will never have enough copies at that rate. So um, that was um, a challenge for us as well. Um, what are we going to do uh, as we look ahead? What is the future of this program? Um, we do have some analysis to do of some of our statistics. We're looking at titles that are are being signed out by students on a regular basis. We have some titles that haven't moved, that haven't circulated once. So what does that speak to our parameters in terms of um, the price point that we've set, et cetera? But at the same time, because textbooks often are on a three to four year sort of cycle, do we, with our, on our ongoing commitment to this program, do we have enough to eventually say that we can actually acquire one copy of every required textbook uh, for every course? Uh, it, I'm, I'm curious to know if we can do that, and I really is hopeful. We do want to learn more about the impact of our service. Is it making a difference? Do students know about the service? Um, so we do want to supplement our quantitative data that we have. Um, with some sound uh, qualitative um, uh, research. We do plan to interview students 
We need to recruit students to interview, FYI, to learn more about their decision-making process around textbooks um, and their process around purchasing or leasing textbooks, ebook versus print. And we want to hear from both the users of our service and the non-users um, uh, how they use or don't use a service and how we can improve it. Going ahead, marketing and promotion continue to be really, really important. And actually, we're really, can we go to the next slide, Kim? One of the things we're really lucky with are our, um, our, the bookstore. They are happy to, um, to help us advertise our service on their website. So um, again, they've been a, a really great partner in this. And um, uh, yeah, and so I mean, I think that's all I'll say right now about our program. I think one of the things that's been really uh, a learning experience um, for us is this, and for me, is this collaboration with the campus bookstore, they, they want, I, th I really do see this collaboration moving ahead within the open education resources arena and how can we work together with them. Um, it will be really interesting. And finally, I just wanna say, I just wanna take this opportunity to say, to make a program like this work, to, it really takes like a, a sort of all hands on deck <laughs> approach and mindset from a lot of staff members at U of A Libraries to make this work for many different departments. And so real kudos to everyone who has helped make this, uh, to launch this program and to make it uh, successful as it is to date. So thank you. Thanks, Angie and Fahim. Um, my name is Sherry Fricker. I am the lead learning design consultant with Technologies in Education and the uh, lead instructor for EDU 210, uh, an introduction to educational technology. It is uh, one of the required courses in the Faculty of Education. Um, so we have, our numbers um, vary from year to year, seven to 800 students a year taking the course in either the blended, um, that's a face-to-face -face, um, online blend or the online component of the course. Um, back about, probably in about 2012, uh, Dr. Janet Welch got involved in the course and I think one of her first um, steps was taking this te this textbook that we had used in the past. When I looked, uh, current prices are about $125 and in the fall of 2012, we removed the textbook. So there was no longer the requirement of a textbook for the course. I should mention that the course is a lecture and a lab. Uh, we have to mention this often to our students. So it's... Um, there's a three-hour lecture and a three-hour lab. So there was actually a textbook for the lecture component of the course, and then there was a lab manual for the lab component of the course that students purchased through the U of A bookstore. So that was probably an additional cost of about $30, uh, depending on how big it was at the time, and I couldn't find the, um, for the stats for sure. So um, yesterday in the keynote, Rajiv shared a quote that a student had said, like, really, how much has French changed? I think we actually have the opposite problem um, in terms of thinking about textbooks. This textbook was out of date before it got into our students' hands. Like when we're thinking about technology, um, so we're asking students to spend $125 that we know isn't gonna serve them well to keep as a resource. I think about all my education resources that I thought, oh, I'm gonna use these forever and ever. And, Eventually, I would go through my garage and dwindle and the, get rid of the resources, and I don't think I have any left. Um, but we do know that technology changes. Since we've gone without the textbook, we had a scenario one semester where our students were using an online tool um, called Pandemian to create their own eBooks because we thought new teachers need to know how to make their own resources so that they can use them with their students. It was up at the beginning of the year. It was available when our students made their books. It was available for our students to submit and get peer assessment. It was not available when the instructors went in to assess the student work. So we know just how quickly technology can change. And having a textbook or even the lab manual that gets printed off and students purchase at the bookstore isn't going to be responsive. And so I think the nature of the course um, being based around technology, the large number of students um, that take the course each year also warrant uh, a different and more flexible approach. So we've calculated roughly, we've probably saved students almost $500,000 since 2012. Um, so that's um, pretty exciting to us. We do have one required option is that students 
um, come to class with some sort of device. So it could be an iPad, it could be a Surface tablet, it could be their phone, um, it could be a laptop. And if they don't have any of those, they can borrow one from us. So we bring Chromebooks to class and we bring different devices. So to, to be able to be successful in the class, they need to have access to a device. They can use them to be in class, but also on campus they can access um, all of our course materials online. I think about, um, think about my students and I often will say to them, oh, and here's a great reading that's an optional reading. Um, and I just recently finished a degree um, at Nate and anytime my instructor said, oh, here's an extra reading that you can read, I never read it. But in those <laughs> course packs, we would decide that we should make them available to students, add them to the course packs, print them out, and then ultimately the students were paying for these readings that you know they weren't necessarily reading. Um, with the online class, a required resource is also a headset. So they need to be able to participate online in Adobe Connect. And we know that the best way for that to work without getting the feedback loops is for students to have a headset. We often then try to help them find out when Best Buy or someone has a sale where you can get a good quality one for 10 to $15. So what we found since we've kind of said goodbye to the textbook, um, and we've started using um, free resources. I think um, in our next phase, we really need to maybe look at um, what um, Rajiv and Cable both talked about the five R's. Looking at the resources we're using with our students and do they fit all five R's? And one of, one of my big ideas is images. We've actually bought some images and so can we use those? And so there's definitely revisions that we have to make. So in creating these resources for our students, we um, went to Google Docs. Because as a team, we teach this course as a team approach. So as a team, we needed a place where we could work and collaborate. So we would create the Google Docs. And initially, we would create a Google Doc. And then we would copy that information into eClass for the online section. And then copy that information into eClass for the face-to-face -face section. We also make all of our course materials available to other um, institutions offering a similar course. So if they want to know what we're using, we make them all available using, um, I think it's up there, the CC by NCSA. Um, so they can use it, they just can't make money off it, and if they make any changes, please just use that same license around it. So we found, and we made this available on a Google site, so that if these other institutions want easy access to it, then they can access it. So we had to, if we made a change, because Pandemian is no longer available, we had to update our documents. We found that we had to go into the online section of eClass and change it there. And we had to go into the face-to-face -face section of eClass and change it there. We had to change it in our Google Doc and we had to make sure our Google site was up to date. So we quickly learned um, that that wasn't the best approach and we found out how we could actually embed our Google Docs right into eClass. So now we just have one version of our information. It's embedded right into um, our eClass. So when we make a change, it's live for everyone. All of our current students, all of our previous students who maybe have saved some of these documents because they want the information, they also are uh, able to have the most recent documents. So because we've gone with Google Docs, we're not limiting our student access to when the course ends and eClass closes, they no longer have access to that information. Um, so again, the next phase, as I mentioned, looking through those five R's to make sure that we really are um, not just focusing on the free part, but that they really are open um, and adaptable uh, by other people. We also want to look at how can we repackage or repurpose some of the course, maybe in a modular form, for other purposes. We've often been asked uh, about providing EDU 210 for practicing teachers. What are teachers out there who, you know, maybe graduated when I did um, in 94 and didn't have a technology course? How are they keeping up to date? So could we consider making this content available to the teachers who wanted to be, just get more up to date. Or um, other purposes, other courses um, as well. We've looked into different formats. So we've looked into taking all of these Google Docs and maybe make, making an iBooks author version. Um, so we have an iBook. Again, though, that then it makes it somewhere else that we have to change information. And so it makes it a little bit more uh, cumbersome to do that. 
we also have decided, uh, Janet and I were talking last night, that we need to share um, these numbers, that we're, the amount that we're saving students. We also need a better way, I think, to advertise that this course has no textbook. We often get emails from students um, prior to, like, you know, like usually in December, we'll get some students emailing us about January. I need to know what the course textbook is. Now, thinking about what uh, Rajiv said yesterday, they probably need to find out how much it costs so they know if they're going to drop the course or not, which really isn't an option because it's a required course. Um, but I don't know, you know, are we properly um, explaining to students when there is a textbook or when there is no textbooks or materials are provided in class? Because I still do get emails from the bookstore saying, hey, can you please let us know what your textbook will be? So is there a way to identify and have it shared with students that this course has no textbook, the materials are provided um, electronically. Um, so I think that's kind of where we're at now. So we're running uh, multiple sections um, each year of EDU 210, multiple students. We've made lots of other changes as well, uh, but we're just focusing um, today on the textbook. So turn it back to Kim, I guess. I'd like to thank our panelists for being here today.